My name is Tom. I'm 42, and I've been married to Emily for 17 years. We live in a quiet suburban neighborhood, the kind of place where everyone knows each other and kids play in the streets until the streetlights come on. Our home is a charming two-story house with a neatly trimmed lawn and a white picket fence, the quintessential American dream. We have two children, Sarah, 15, and Michael, 12. Life here has always been simple and predictable. I work as a financial analyst at a reputable firm downtown, while Emily is a high school English teacher. Our routine is well-oiled. Mornings are a flurry of getting the kids ready for school, packing lunches, and hurrying off to work. Evenings are filled with homework, dinner, and sometimes a family game or movie night. Weekends are usually spent catching up with friends, barbecuing in the backyard, or attending one of Michael's soccer games or Sarah's dance recitals. Emily and I have had a good marriage, or so I thought. We met in college, fell in love quickly, and married shortly after graduation. We've shared our ups and downs, but we always seem to come out stronger on the other side. Or at least, that's what I believed until a few months ago when subtle changes in Emily's behavior started to unsettle me. It started with little things. Emily began to stay late at work more often, citing meetings and school events that seemed to stretch on endlessly. She would come home tired, distant, and unusually preoccupied. I tried to be understanding. Teaching can be exhausting. But something about her demeanor felt off. She became protective of her phone, a device she once left carelessly around the house. Now it was always within her reach, and she would shield the screen whenever I was nearby. Our sex life, which had been steady and satisfying, dwindled to almost nothing. Emily's excuses ranged from exhaustion to headaches, and while I wanted to believe her, I couldn't shake the feeling that something else was at play. Conversations with her became strained. She was often lost in thought, barely listening to what I was saying. The warmth and connection that once defined our relationship seemed to be evaporating replaced by a cold distance that left me feeling like a stranger in my own home. One evening, as I was tidying up the living room after dinner, I noticed Emily had left her laptop open on the kitchen counter. Curious and concerned, I glanced at the screen. She had been messaging someone on Facebook, someone named David. The conversation was innocuous at first glance, filled with casual exchanges about work and life. But as I scrolled up, I saw a different tone emerge. They joked and flirted, their words laced with a familiarity that went beyond friendship. My heart pounded as I read their messages. David was our neighbor, a charming man in his late thirties who had moved in a year ago. He was single, friendly, and had quickly become a popular figure in our community. He often joined our neighborhood gatherings, and while I never had any reason to suspect him of ill intentions, the messages between him and Emily painted a different picture. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. Could Emily be having an affair with David? The thought was too painful to accept, but the evidence was right there in front of me. I knew I had to find out the truth, no matter how much it hurt. The next few days were a blur of anxiety and suspicion. I couldn't get the messages between Emily and David out of my mind. I replayed every interaction we'd had with David, scrutinizing them for signs I might have missed. The friendly smiles, the casual touches. Had there been something more to it all along? One Friday evening, I decided to confront my suspicions head on. Emily had mentioned she'd be working late again, a claim that now filled me with doubt and dread. As she left the house, I made an excuse about needing to go out for a while. Once I was sure she was gone, I doubled back and parked a few houses down the street, waiting for something, anything, that would confirm my fears. Hours passed, and the street grew quiet. I was beginning to think I'd overreacted when I saw Emily's car pull up in front of David's house. My heart sank. She stepped out of the car, glanced around as if to make sure no one was watching, and hurried up to his front door. It swung open immediately, and David greeted her with a smile. They exchanged a quick kiss before disappearing inside. A mix of rage and heartbreak surged through me. There it was, the undeniable proof of Emily's betrayal. I wanted to burst in, to confront them both, but I knew I needed more than just my word against theirs. I took out my phone, snapping a few photos of Emily entering David's house, ensuring I had evidence of her deceit. I sat in my car, wrestling with my emotions. I needed to see just how deep this betrayal ran. Stealing myself, I got out of the car and quietly approached David's house. 
The front windows were closed, but I noticed a faint glow of light from the side of the house. Carefully, I crept to the side and peered through a small gap in the curtains. What I saw shattered any remaining hope I had. Emily and David were in his living room, wrapped in each other's arms, kissing passionately. Their clothes quickly came off, and they moved to the couch, their bodies entwined in a way that left no doubt about what was happening. I watched, paralyzed by a mix of fury and sorrow, as my wife and our neighbor made love in front of me. Emily's moans and David's whispered words of affection felt like daggers to my heart. I wanted to look away, but I couldn't. I had to see the full extent of their betrayal. I took out my phone again, recording the scene through the window. I needed this evidence, not just for any potential legal battles, but to make sure I wasn't imagining the depth of their deceit. Finally, I couldn't bear to watch any longer. I stumbled back to my car, my mind racing with thoughts of revenge and confrontation. I drove home in a daze, my hands trembling on the steering wheel. How could Emily do this to me, to our family? The woman I loved, the mother of my children, was now a stranger someone capable of such cruel betrayal. When Emily returned home later that night, she acted as if nothing had happened. She climbed into bed beside me, her scent still mingled with the remnants of her betrayal. I lay there, rigid and silent, trying to suppress the storm of emotions raging inside me. She was so close, yet felt so far away. I knew I couldn't keep this inside any longer. The confrontation was inevitable, and it was going to be fierce. The next morning I woke with a renewed sense of purpose. The rage and heartbreak from the previous night had crystallized into a cold determination. I couldn't allow this betrayal to go unchallenged. Emily had to face the consequences of her actions, and I needed to reclaim control of my life. The moment had come to confront her and expose the truth. As the kids left for school, I told Emily we needed to talk. She glanced at me with a mix of curiosity and irritation. Can it wait, Tom? I've got a lot of grading to do. No, I replied, my voice firm. It can't wait. We sat down at the kitchen table. Emily looked at me expectantly, but there was an edge of defensiveness in her eyes as if she knew something was wrong. I know about you and David, I began, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside me. I saw you last night at his house. Emily's face drained of color. She opened her mouth to speak, but no words came out. She looked like a deer caught in headlights, and for a brief moment, I almost felt sorry for her. Almost. I saw everything, I continued, pulling out my phone and showing her the photos and the video. I have proof, Emily. There's no point in lying anymore. She stared at the images, her eyes widening in horror. Tom, I, I can explain, she stammered, but the words sounded hollow, even to her. Explain? I scoffed, unable to contain my anger any longer. Explain how you could betray me, betray our family for months. Explain how you could lie to my face every day. There's no explanation that could justify what you've done. Tears began to stream down Emily's face, but they did nothing to soften my resolve. I never meant to hurt you, Tom, she said, her voice shaking. It just happened. I was lonely, and David, he was there for me. Lonely? I repeated, incredulous. You were lonely, so you decided to sleep with our neighbor. Do you have any idea what you've done to me, to our children? Emily's sobs grew louder, but I couldn't let her tears distract me. You think you're the victim here? You did this, Emily. You destroyed our family. I'm sorry, Tom, she whispered, but her apology felt like a slap in the face. I know I've hurt you, but I love you. I never stopped loving you. Love? I spat, standing up and pacing the kitchen. You call this love? Sneaking around, lying, cheating? You don't know the meaning of the word. Emily stood up too, her eyes red and swollen. I was lost, Tom. I didn't know how to fix things between us. David was a mistake, a terrible mistake, but I didn't know what else to do. So you turned to another man instead of talking to me? I shouted, the rage bubbling up again. You had a choice, Emily, and you chose to betray me. She sank back into her chair, her sobs turning into a guttural cry. Please, Tom. Give me a chance to make it right. I'll do anything. We can go to counseling, whatever it takes. Just don't leave me. I looked at her. The woman I once loved more than anything, now reduced to a sobbing mess before me. Part of me wanted to believe her, to hope that we could somehow salvage our marriage. But the damage was too deep, the betrayal too great. I don't know if I can ever trust you again. 
I said quietly. You destroyed that trust the moment you stepped into David's house. I can't just forget that. Emily's eyes filled with desperation. Tom, please, think about the kids. They need both of us. We can find a way to get through this, together. The mention of our children hit me hard. I had to consider their well-being, but I also knew I couldn't continue living in this lie. I needed time to think, to figure out the best path forward for all of us. I need some time, I said finally. I can't make any promises right now, but I need you to understand how deeply you've hurt me. This isn't something we can just sweep under the rug. Emily nodded, her tears still flowing. I understand, Tom. I'll do whatever it takes to make things right. I walked out of the kitchen, leaving her there, broken and sobbing. I needed space to clear my head and decide what to do next. The confrontation was over, but the real challenge lay ahead, figuring out how to rebuild my life after this betrayal. Over the next few days, I grappled with the turmoil inside me. The confrontation with Emily had left me emotionally drained, but my anger hadn't subsided. I couldn't just let her off the hook for what she had done. The thought of her and David together, laughing behind my back, made my blood boil. I needed to do something to reclaim my dignity and make them both understand the consequences of their actions. I spent hours devising a plan. It wasn't enough to simply confront them. I wanted them to feel the full weight of their betrayal. I began gathering more evidence making sure I had everything I needed to expose their affair publicly. I knew David's schedule well enough, having seen him around the neighborhood often enough to know his habits. One afternoon, I decided to put my plan into action. I knew David would be home alone while Emily was at work. I walked over to his house, carrying a box filled with the evidence I'd collected, photos, videos, and copies of their messages. My heart pounded as I knocked on his door, but my resolve was unshaken. David answered the door looking surprised to see me. Tom, what are you doing here? He asked, his casual demeanor infuriating me even more. We need to talk, I said, pushing past him into his living room. About you and Emily. His face paled as he realized what I meant. Tom, listen, I can explain. Save it, I snapped, dropping the box on his coffee table. Here's everything you need to know about your little affair. He glanced at the contents of the box, then back at me his eyes wide with panic. Tom, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Emily and I, Emily and you betrayed me, I interrupted, my voice cold. And now everyone is going to know. Without waiting for his response, I turned and walked out of his house, leaving him standing there in stunned silence. I drove straight to my office, where I had already planned the next step. I composed an email to our neighborhood association, attaching the evidence of Emily and David's affair. I kept the message simple and direct, making sure it was clear what they had done. As I hit send, a sense of grim satisfaction washed over me. This was just the beginning. I had also planned to confront Emily at her school. She was a respected teacher, and I knew that revealing her affair would have significant consequences for her professionally. It was a harsh move, but I felt it was justified given the depth of her betrayal. I arrived at her school just before the end of the day. I waited in the parking lot until I saw her emerge from the building talking with a colleague. I approached them, ignoring the curious glances from other staff members and students. Emily, we need to talk, I said loudly enough for others to hear. She looked at me, her face a mask of confusion and fear. Tom, what are you doing here? She asked, trying to maintain her composure. I thought it was time your colleagues knew the truth about you, I said, pulling out the folder of evidence. Emily has been having an affair with our neighbor David for months. Here's the proof. Gasps and whispers erupted around us as I handed the folder to her colleague. Emily's face turned crimson as she reached out to grab the folder, but it was too late. The damage was done. Tom, please don't do this, she begged, tears streaming down her face. It's too late, Emily. You made your choices and now you have to face the consequences, I said, turning to leave. I hope it was worth it. As I walked away, I felt a mix of vindication and sorrow. This was not how I had envisioned my life turning out, but I couldn't let them get away with what they had done. The repercussions of my actions rippled through our community, and both Emily and David faced the fallout from their affair. Emily was suspended from her job pending an investigation, and David became a pariah in the neighborhood. Despite the sense of justice, the revenge did little to soothe my pain. The trust that had been shattered could never be restored, and the life I had known was gone forever. 
Yet, in taking action, I had reclaimed a part of myself that had been lost in the betrayal. The path to healing was still long, but I had taken the first steps toward a new beginning. The days following my public exposure of Emily and David's affair were a whirlwind of chaos and confrontation. Emily had been suspended from her teaching position, and David was now an outcast in the neighborhood. The community's reaction was swift and unforgiving, and both of them were feeling the full weight of their actions. But amid all the upheaval, there was still one final conversation that needed to happen, a conversation that would determine the future of our fractured family. One evening, after the kids had gone to bed, I found Emily sitting in the living room. Her eyes were red and puffy from crying, and she looked utterly defeated. For a moment, I almost felt sorry for her. But the memory of her betrayal quickly hardened my resolve. I took a deep breath and sat down across from her, ready to face the storm. Emily, I began, my voice steady but firm. We need to talk. She nodded silently, wiping away her tears. I know she whispered. I've ruined everything. There was a long pause as we stared at each other, the weight of our shared history hanging heavily between us. Finally, I broke the silence. Why, Emily? I asked, my voice breaking. Why did you do it? She looked down at her hands, unable to meet my gaze. I don't know, she said, her voice barely audible. I was lonely, Tom. You were always working, and I felt so alone. David was there, and it just happened. Just happened, I echoed, my anger flaring up again. You don't accidentally have an affair, Emily. You made a choice. You lied to me, to our kids, to everyone. I know, she sobbed. I know I made a terrible mistake, but I never stopped loving you, Tom. I was just lost. Lost, I repeated, shaking my head. Do you have any idea what you've done to me, to our family? You've destroyed everything we built together. I'm so sorry she whispered, her voice filled with desperation. I know I don't deserve your forgiveness, but please, Tom, can't we find a way to fix this? For the kids? I sighed, feeling the weight of her words. Our children were innocent victims in all of this, and I had to consider their well-being. But the trust between us had been shattered, and I didn't know if it could ever be rebuilt. Emily, I don't know if we can fix this, I said quietly. The trust is gone. Every time I look at you, all I see is betrayal. She buried her face in her hands, sobbing uncontrollably. Please, Tom, I'll do anything. Counseling, therapy, whatever it takes. Just don't leave me. I closed my eyes, trying to block out the sound of her tears. I had already made up my mind, but seeing her like this made it harder to follow through. Still, I knew what had to be done. I need time, Emily, I said finally. Time to think. Time to figure out what's best for the kids. But I can't promise you anything right now. She looked up at me, her eyes filled with hope and desperation. Please, Tom, just give me a chance. I need space, I repeated, standing up. I'll be staying with a friend for a few days. We'll talk more when I get back. As I walked out of the house, I felt a mix of relief and sorrow. This was the hardest decision I had ever made, but I knew it was the right one. Emily needed to understand the full impact of her actions, and I needed time to heal and decide what was best for our family. Over the next few days I stayed with a close friend, giving myself the distance I needed to think clearly. I missed the kids terribly, but I knew this time apart was necessary. I spoke with a lawyer and began to explore my options, both for divorce and for custody arrangements. My priority was ensuring that Sarah and Michael would be okay, no matter what happened between Emily and me. When I returned home, Emily was waiting for me, looking anxious and hopeful. We sat down together, and I told her about my discussions with the lawyer and my thoughts on our future. Emily, I think we need to separate, I said gently but firmly. At least for now. I can't move past this without some distance. She nodded, tears streaming down her face. I understand, Tom. I'll do whatever it takes to make this right. Focus on the kids, I replied. They need both of us, but they also need stability. We'll work out the details with the lawyer, but I think this is the best way forward. As I spoke, I could see the pain in Emily's eyes. 
but also a glimmer of understanding. This wasn't just about her and me. It was about our children and their future. It was about finding a way to rebuild our lives, even if it meant doing so separately. In the weeks that followed, we began the process of separation. It was painful and messy, but it was also necessary. Emily moved into a small apartment nearby, and we worked out a custody arrangement that allowed the kids to spend time with both of us. It wasn't easy, but it was a step towards healing. Through it all, I focused on being there for Sarah and Michael, helping them navigate this new reality. Emily and I attended counseling sessions separately, trying to work through our own issues and come to terms with what had happened. One evening, as I was tucking the kids into bed, Sarah looked up at me with her big, innocent eyes. Dad, are we going to be okay? I smiled, brushing a strand of hair from her face. Yes, sweetheart, we are. It's going to be different, but we'll find a way to be happy again. I promise. As I left their room and closed the door, I felt a sense of hope. The road ahead would be long and challenging, but I knew we would get through it. For the sake of my children, for my own sanity, and even for Emily, I had to believe that better days were coming. The decision to move forward with a formal separation eventually led to the inevitable. Divorce proceedings. The trial process was a grueling and emotional experience, one that forced both Emily and me to confront the full extent of our broken marriage. Emily's affair with David had left deep scars, not just on our relationship, but on our entire family. As we prepared for the trial, I worked closely with my lawyer to ensure that the evidence of the affair would be a key factor in determining the outcome. My goal was to secure primary custody of Sarah and Michael, to provide them with the stability they needed in this turbulent time. The courtroom was a cold, sterile place, a stark contrast to the warmth and comfort of our home, now just a memory. Emily and I sat on opposite sides, our lawyers doing most of the talking. I could barely look at her. The woman who had once been my partner in everything now felt like a stranger. During the trial, my lawyer presented the evidence of Emily's affair with David. The photos, the videos, the text messages. It was painful to relive those moments. But it was necessary to ensure that the court understood the impact of her actions on our family. Emily's lawyer tried to argue that her affair was a result of feeling neglected and lonely. But my lawyer countered by highlighting the importance of trust and responsibility in a marriage. The judge listened carefully, weighing the evidence and the testimonies from both sides. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the judge made a decision. Emily and I were granted a divorce, and I was awarded primary custody of Sarah and Michael. Emily was given visitation rights, allowing her to spend time with the kids on weekends and during school holidays. As the judge delivered the verdict, I felt a mix of relief and sadness. This was the end of a chapter in my life, one that had been filled with love, betrayal, and heartache. But it was also the beginning of a new chapter, one where I could focus on rebuilding my life and providing a stable, loving environment for my children. After the trial, Emily and I had a brief, tense conversation outside the courtroom. Tom, I'm so sorry for everything, she said, her voice trembling. I never wanted it to end like this. I know, Emily, I replied, my voice soft but firm. But this is where we are now. We have to move forward for the kids' sake. She nodded, tears in her eyes. I'll do my best to be there for them, I promise. I hope you do, I said, turning to leave. They need you too. As I walked away, I felt a sense of closure. The trial had been a painful ordeal, but it was also a necessary step towards healing. I was ready to start a new chapter in my life, one where I could focus on my children, my work, and my own well-being. Life after the divorce was challenging, but it was also a time of growth and rediscovery. I threw myself into my work, finding solace in the familiar routine of my job. I spent as much time as possible with Sarah and Michael, making sure they felt loved and supported despite the upheaval in their lives. We settled into a new routine, one that included therapy sessions for all of us. Talking to a professional helped me process my emotions and work through the pain of Emily's betrayal. It also helped the kids understand that the divorce wasn't their fault and that both their parents still loved them deeply. Emily and I maintained a cordial relationship for the sake of the children. She honored her visitation rights, and we communicated regularly about the kids' needs and activities. It wasn't easy but it was necessary to ensure that Sarah and Michael felt secure and loved. Over time, I began to heal. 
The anger and resentment that had once consumed me slowly faded, replaced by a sense of acceptance and peace. I started to focus on my own well-being, taking up hobbies I had long neglected and reconnecting with old friends. One evening, a few months after the divorce was finalized, I attended a neighborhood barbecue. It was the first social event I had gone to in a long time, and I was nervous about facing the community after everything that had happened. But as I mingled with my neighbors, I realized that people were supportive and understanding. They knew the pain I had been through, and they respected my efforts to rebuild my life. At the barbecue, I met Laura, a single mother who had recently moved to the neighborhood. We struck up a conversation, and I found myself drawn to her warmth and kindness. Over the next few weeks, we started spending more time together, and a new relationship began to blossom. Laura was different from Emily in many ways. She was patient, understanding, and genuinely interested in my well-being. She had also been through a difficult divorce, and we found comfort in sharing our experiences and supporting each other. As my relationship with Laura grew, so did my sense of hope and optimism. I realized that I could find happiness again, that I could build a new life filled with love and joy. It wasn't about replacing Emily or forgetting the past, but about moving forward and embracing the possibilities of the future. One evening, as Laura and I sat on the porch, watching the sunset, she took my hand and smiled. You deserve to be happy, Tom, she said softly. We both do. I squeezed her hand, feeling a sense of gratitude and peace. I think we're on the right path, I replied, smiling back. As I looked out at the horizon, I felt a sense of contentment. The road to healing had been long and difficult, but I had made it through. I had learned to value myself, to trust again, and to embrace the future with hope and determination. The betrayal that had once defined my life was now just a chapter in my past. I had emerged stronger, wiser, and ready to build a new life filled with love, happiness, and endless possibilities. And as I looked at Laura, I knew that the best was yet to come.